Disney uh, Marvel series that are coming to Disney+. Plus. Wrap on principle means that we have a post to finish with, so six, eight months is when we're going to be seeing that. Uh, I am sure the announcement for when it's going to air has been, but I just now thought that I probably should have wrote that down, so my apologies. Welcome once again, nerds, to your nerd news. Once weekly, place to get all of the news for the uh, nerdy inclined and such. Uh, so we have follow-ups all over the place this episode. Uh, very little regular ass news, a whole lot of follow-ups and some trailers thrown in there just for flavor. Uh, following up on Batman Caped Crusader, as well as Weird the Al Yankovic movie, as well as Dan Lin's inclusion into the DCEU as their Feige-like figure seems to be spurning the rumor mill pretty well, uh, fueling the rumor mill, I guess I should say. So all of that, and then honestly a bunch more. <laughs> so without any further ado, let's jump into some housekeeping. Uh, first in housekeeping, we are getting really close. Thank you very much for all of these subscribers and everything on both the main channel and the uh, clips channel on the YouTube. Now, if we could get some of that motion over to some of the socials, that would be wonderful as well. But we are hitting benchmarks. And so that is awesome. Thank you very much, nerds. Um, as well as uh, the, uh, anything coming up, I don't think there is a whole lot coming up as far as scheduling issues. Um, I do have some concerts and things that will be disrupting our live shows uh, very soon. So I think, honestly, this weekend might be one of those weekends. I can't remember. So stay tuned to the socials to be certain. Uh, one way or the next, I will post it and publish it. And also, if you're not following on the socials, then you're missing out on some pretty awesome AI uh, art that I have been doing. So long rambling intro out of the way let's talk news first thing uh, is music as per usual we have a very large music section very large music section largely uh new music videos a couple of tours and this is probably the section with the most regular ass news so let's do that uh starting off we have no follow-ups in this one again the unique section music usually is but we do have a fair amount of new music to talk about First piece of new music is a piece that we've been following for a moment. Devin Townsend's new project. The name of the record is Lightwork. It's coming out October 28th. The name of the song and video that he's released is called Moon People. And this is not what you are expecting from Devin Townsend. Uh, the name of the record, again, Lightwork, definitely reflects the feeling of this song. Has this weird, like, almost 80s kind of layered quality to it, kind of synthy even. So very interesting, not much as far as Chiggy Chuggas and heaviness. So again, very not Devin Townsend, but pretty enjoyable nonetheless, surprisingly. So uh, link down in the description to the video, go check this out. This is a recommend if, if for no other reason than curiosity's sake. Our next piece of new music is also a video, and it comes from Machine Head. The name of this song is uh, No Gods, No Masters. It comes from their just-released Kingdom of, uh, of Kingdom and Crown, rather. Uh, and this new track, it's a little long. I'm not going not gonna to lie. It is definitely a little bit long, but... Do I like a Machine Head song all of a sudden? Now, don't get me wrong. I do have an appreciation for Machine Head. I do have respect for what Rob Flynn and company do. But generally speaking, I'm not a big fan. There are some songs that I have liked along the way. But up until this point, I couldn't say that I really dug an album. And I don't know that I necessarily dig Kingdom and Crown. But this song specifically on Kingdom and Crown 
is enjoyable, is very well laid out, plays with the dynamics, plays up Rob Flint, what I view as Rob Flint's uh, vocal strengths and kind of shies away from some of the things that he's not so great at. Uh, I think this is a hearty recommend for the metal-minded. Uh, and even if you just like a pretty well-crafted song, you're not necessarily leaning in one genre direction or another, give this one a listen just because this is, again, very expertly crafted and I'm kind of impressed. Next up is a band called Semi-Rotted. Uh, this is a uh, band whose lead singer also was in a, another band called Psychosexual, who then changed the name to Psycho Sinner, I believe and it was hot garbage. Uh, the name of the man that we are speaking of is Jeremy Spencer. He used to play uh, drums for Five Finger Death Punch. That Psycho Sinner band was hot garbage, and this semi-rotted is actually kind of good. This is enjoyable. It's quick. Uh, from what I've seen, they have released two singles off of this new record. Uh, they're both sub three minutes, so it's almost like death metal punk rock. This song specifically is a song called Torture Congregation. It features guest vocals from Will Ramos uh, from Lorna Shore. For, for those of you that don't know that name, which there's like five of you. Uh, yeah, this is honestly enjoyable. If you are, you know, death metal is kind of for a certain subsect of people. So if you like that, then I definitely recommend this. Probably not the best death metal song to start your appreciation for. So if you don't listen to that kind of stuff, maybe steer away. But yeah, it, very interestingly good considering the other garbage this guy has given us. Then we're talking about Architect's new track, Deep Fake. Um, I, I'm kind of lukewarm on Architects, which is, I guess, a little blasphemic uh, in the days of the modern metalcore because they kind of lay the groundwork for what all of the other modern metalcore bands are trying to do. And I don't necessarily see why, because I kind of grew up with the early stages of metalcore, so like Shadows Fall, Kills Which Engage, so on and so forth, Unearth, all of this beautiful stuff. Um, and Architects just kind of seen a little secondary in comparison. They're fantastic. I'm not trying to, to sell them short, especially with this deep fake track. It's great. I really, really enjoyed this. It's very much a departure, though, from the sound that they've been establishing. I think because everyone keeps, you know, trying to copy what they're doing, so they have to be the ones that do something new, and I appreciate this newness. This is a hearty recommend for the new deep fakes track from Architects. And then we're talking In Flames. We're actually going to be talking In Flames a number of times in today's episode. But first time we're talking about them is for the release of their new track, The Great Deceiver. Uh, In Flames is solid, solid, solid proto-metalcore stuff. Uh, I believe they get lumped in with the Swedish melodic death. Um, nah, I don't, I don't like subgenres, we know this, but I don't necessarily see why they get lumped in with Swedish melodic death. They are a thing unto themselves, and you can definitely see how they have influenced the sound of what has become modern metalcore and just kind of the evolution from them to now. They are still doing the thing that they always do. Uh, if you are a fan of bands like Kills Which Engage and Shadows Fall and such, then definitely check out the new In Flames track, The Great Deceiver, is worth your time. Kicking over to tours. All right. So, uh, of course it is that time of year where we are starting to gear up for holidays and such. And that means if we're talking tours, we're talking Trans-Siberian Orchestra. They have just announced their slew of tour dates for the next uh, roughly four or five months. Uh, they're going to be touring starting in uh, the end of October, running all the way through uh, January, and there are two touring companies playing the TSO music. So there are honestly so many tour dates, I did not write any of them down. I did, however, down in the description, link to the website where you can purchase tickets, because if you haven't seen TSO, you probably should. <laughs> uh, even if you don't necessarily appreciate Christmas music, you appreciate Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Those guys are incredible musicians, and I don't care if you like metal or not. It's music worth listening to. So go get your tickets for Trans-Siberian Orchestra. They have just announced dates. Go see where yours falls 
odds are they're coming to see you probably twice. <laughs> uh, next on the tour list, we have, it's not technically a tour, it is a special show. This is for Danny Elfman this time, where we spoke about Gore's uh, Halloween show last episode, or two episodes ago. We now have a special Halloween episode for Danny Elfman. Or it wasn't Gore, it was... Uh, 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 the Misfits, that's what it was. Misfits had a special show. Uh, this time, Danny Elfman, uh, it is going to be a very similar band to what we saw him use uh, on Coachella. Uh, just a real quick refresher on that. Guitarist, we have Wes Borland, yay. Uh, Neely Brosh, who was not on the Coachella date. We also have bassist Stu Brooks, who was. Josh Fries on the drums, who also was. Fries and Borland together is always amazing on top of the fact that you're going to see Danny Elfman. It is a single date, like I said. It's going to be the Hollywood Bowl on Halloween. Uh, if you can get tickets, they're going to be ridiculously expensive, so congratulations, you make a million dollars a year. Uh, and it's gonna be great to watch in post, I'm sure, but I don't, I'm not gonna be able to get tickets. Uh, I wouldn't be even if I lived in California. <laughs> and our next tour announcement has to do with Pantera. This is kind of a follow-up, not exactly a tour per se, because it is only four dates and they are all festival dates. Uh, and it sounds like that is going to be how Pantera goes across the world. This iteration, I guess, of Pantera is going to be uh, trekking across the world is through toward rather is through festival dates. Um, those festival dates are as follows. We have December 2nd is going to be the Hell and Heaven Metal Fest uh, in Me Mexico. I'm not even gonna try and pronounce the name of the city of Mexico, but it's in Mexico somewhere. And then you have December 9th, 11th, and 18th. They're going to be on the uh, Not Fest bill alongside Slipknot and other major heavyweights in the metal community. Uh, none of these dates are American dates just yet. So as those get announced, as they get some big enough uh, festivals to house Pantera, we will be talking about it. But that is all we have for the Pantera tour dates right now. And then our final tour that literally just got announced, only one of, one outlet had the dates that I could see uh, be, uh, as I was doing the research for this last night. And that is Cannibal Corp. Corpse has literally just announced a tour starting November 3rd, running through December 10th. They're going to be touring with Dark Funeral, Immolation, and Black Anvil. I will link down in the description the specific dates. However, uh, tickets have not gone on sale for anything yet, so stay tuned for that. That is what we have for tours, though. Let's roll into regular-ass news, and like I said, we are going to be talking about in flames a number of times. This is that second number of times. This time we're talking about They've released a hot sauce. <laughs> Apparently, the dudes in the Inflames, uh, the the metalcore Godfathers, uh, have released a hot sauce with Heartbeat Hot Sauce Company. It is a variation on the main hot sauce that the company has released. Sounds like it's going to be a little bit hotter than that main variation. Uh, and yeah, just super interesting. I really love it when bands start to branch out and do more than just hey, we got T-shirts or sleep in their brilliant uh, you know, pillowcases. I, I think it's cool when, you know, you get a band like uh, Slipknot has a, an alcohol, uh, I think I believe it was a whiskey, uh, and, and then now In Flames has a hot sauce and, and uh, other bands with their tequilas and the vodkas. I think that's it's starting to become a little tripe, but right now it's still pretty cool. Uh, as we go into other places and we see other bands doing like helping starting labels and things like that so they can help out the community. I just think it's a beautiful thing. So yeah, In Flames doing their part in uh, enriching the culture of the metalhead community. I, I think it's awesome. Uh, our next piece is a little sticky and uh, we're gonna get into some strange territory. Hold on. All right, so our next piece has to do with the Murder Dolls, a band I thought we were done talking about. Uh, it is significant uh, that the genesis of this news piece has to do with the fact that the first record, Beyond the Valley of the Murder Dolls, is now 20 years old. That makes me feel super old. <laughs> 
but it is a thing. Um, so, and that's kind of where this comes from. Uh, what is happening? So members of the band of the Murder Dolls, obviously not Joey. Uh, Joey Jordanson famously was the uh, godfather of this band. He, it, it, it was birthed from his brain and he and Wednesday 13 kind of were the creative forces behind everything attached to the Murder Dolls. So we're going to just lay that out. That is without debate exactly how this band started and continued. So uh, the 20th anniversary uh, of the Beyond the Valley of the Murder Dolls record saw A.C. Slade, who was guitar player, the other guitar player on that record, as well as Eric Griffin, who I believe was the drummer for that record, uh, have launched a new website around the the uh, the band. Have also launched merch and things dealing with the name the Murder Dolls and Wednesday Thirteen, who has been the vocalist for the entirety of the lifespan of that band, uh, has taken to social media to kind of let the world know exactly what's going on. It would seem that AC and Eric do not have the permission to do these things, at least not from the Jordanson estate. They did go through all of the hoops legally as far as what they had to do in order to obtain the rights to do this from Warner Brothers, because I believe that's the record company that owned the rights to the actual music and the records and so on and so forth. So they've done their legal duty in that they can legally represent themselves as the murder dolls and then capitalize on said money. But they didn't okay it with anyone else uh, associated with the project, not the least of which the Joey Jordanson estate, which I think they would have a say in this. So I think it's kind of weird that they didn't have to be consulted for the rights issues. Um, but then again, Wednesday 13 said, no, this isn't an official thing. And AC's response is the thing that really kills me on this. AC's response is, well, we did our legal duty, so you, you can't stop us. And, and also, anyone who's associated with the Murder Dolls should do what we're doing and use it as a platform for their future endeavors. Which screams to me that AC just doesn't believe that anything he's doing since the murder, since he's been, he was only on this first record. Murder Dolls put out two proper records, and each record had a completely different lineup, save for Joey Jordanson and Wednesday 13. So everyone else on the record was a different player. So AC was only on one album of this band, who was honestly kind of, if I'm being 100% honest, uh, who was kind of, famous for being associated with the other main band that Joey Jordanson was a part of, i.e. Slipknot. So they got notoriety borrowed from somebody else, and so now AC Slade is trying to borrow from borrowed notoriety, and just, it's screams of desperation and sadness and just... It's, it's really unfortunate, but it is what's going on. Uh, I think Wednesday 13 is absolutely right to, to call these guys out for being the grifters that they are. Uh, I think if you are putting out quality music, you don't need to uh, re lean on the notoriety of somebody else. You should just be able to do good quality music. And our, I mean, honestly, AC Slade is a dude that's been in the music industry for a while. He has something of a name unto himself, so... Why does he need to make this a platform for which he can jump from? I just, I don't, I, I, it, none of that part of it really makes sense and just seems sad. Uh, so that's what we have for the Murder Dolls. Uh, our last regular ass piece of news has to do with Black Veil Brides, a band we don't talk about on this uh, uh, channel very often because I'm not a big fan. Andy Beersack, vocalist for the band, uh, does things for the community, so I do appreciate it. So when things like this happen, that's when we talk about them. But as far as their musical releases, we'll let you know when they release stuff, but I don't really react or review any of their stuff because I'm not a fan. Anyway, uh, and, and like I don't, I don't feel the need to... I don't think it would be constructive to uh, kind of analyze their stuff necessarily until it becomes a little bit more noteworthy. And that sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, and I'm not. But continuing on, I'm going to stop with this bird walking. Uh, so B Black Veil Brides were supposed to play in uh, Colorado at the Red Rocks Amphitheater last night. So the 30th, as I'm recording this, it should have been tonight. <laughs> but, you know, the life happens, and I'm recording a little late. Anyway, 
Uh, so they, the weird technical issues, the entire show went on because they're on tour right now with Ice Nine Kills and somebody else. And I, I didn't write it down because it's not necessarily pertinent to the episode, but, uh, they are on tour with other bands. The other two main bands on the bill got to play the show, but for whatever reason, Blackville Brides, who's in the middle of the bill, didn't, uh, there was issues that stopped them from playing for whatever reason. It sounded like it was technical, according to the article that I read, but uh, it, that doesn't make any sense. If one band can play and the last band can play, then what about, why does the middle band not, uh, that, uh, I would have to see the technical breakdown of what happened in order to buy that it was something technical and not some sort of interpersonal issues. Um, so, Instead of playing their set, Beersack came out, Andy Beersack, again, vocalist for Blackville Brides, came out on stage and said, sorry guys, there have been issues, we are not going to be able to play tonight, but, and I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, we will be playing later in Denver this week, this coming Thursday, it is going to be a free show for everyone who has tickets from tonight. Uh, the venue that they're playing is a venue called the Gothic Theater. It is a much smaller venue, so I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure that they're not anticipating the entirety of uh, the Red Rocks crowd to show up because they wouldn't be able to take them all. But that's still pretty awesome. Uh, they were even called out online on the Twitters by Mr. D. Snyder himself from Twisted Sister about how awesome they were to their fans. And I must agree, that was pretty incredible thing for uh, the guys in Blackfield Brides to do. So, I mean, kudos to that. We're, we're ending this section, the, the regular news anyway, on a high note. I think that is a fantastic thing to do, to do for the community. Uh, let's move right along in this crazy news thing and get to music suggestions. This musical suggestion is, because it's the 20th anniversary, Murder Dolls, Beyond the Valley of the Murder Dolls, is a classic goth punk glam weird amalgamation of stuff that just somehow works even though on paper it really shouldn't. Uh, Joey Jordanson and Wednesday 13 really really are, are very interesting together. I think Wednesday's unique vocals shine on this first record is much more even than the second record though the second record is also very good. Um, and Joey as guitar player was something that nobody really expected so that is why the uh, suggestion this week for music is Murder Dolls Beyond the Valley of the Murder Dolls. Let's talk gaming and tech. I have noise issues. I hopefully will be able to get it in post, but either way, I apologize. Things are happening outside the studio that I have no control over. So, gaming and tech news. We have some follow-ups. We're talking more about the Embracer Group. Uh, I didn't. I didn't have the greatest details last time. They're just buying up a bunch of smaller developers. They seem to be going about it in a pretty good way, uh, as far as I'm sure many industry analysts analysts would say, because they they started by buying up smaller developers, and now they have moved up to some pretty big ones. Uh, they started with developers who've specialized in mobile gaming and things like that, and now they have purchased uh, Crystal Dynamics, IDOS Montreal, and soon to be renamed Square Enix Montreal. Uh, yeah, th these are all Western developers from Square Enix that they have bought. So even though Square Enix Montreal is going to share a name, it's not going to be the same company. Very interesting. Uh, I don't know exactly. I was unable to find if there is any sort of connection between Embracer and Square Enix from Japan. Um, but yeah, they're just, they're going crazy, buying everybody. Next, on follow-ups for Gaming and Tech, we're talking about Halo. Uh, the next event for Halo is, uh, Halo Infinite, is the yapping, just the goofy, goofy little thing. And some of the stuff has leaked ahead of time. We have uh, Maddie is a new AI. We have a whole bunch of Forge things that have, got, that have come out, as well as a bunch of new weapons. And uh, I mean, the, the, we talked about all of the other new things. This is just a follow-up because we saw the AI images on the live show and we went over the new weapons on the live show. But now we have, you know, this isn't a live show. This is a bigger audience than the live show does. So I had to put it in here too. Uh, yeah, super exciting. Halo, uh, we're moving on. So 
our final piece of follow-up for gaming and tech has to do with that Logitech console that we've talked about. Yes, that's right, you heard me correctly. Logitech is getting into the console business. Kind of. Uh, so some pictures have found their way onto the interwebs recently. You're not seeing them on the screen right now because Logitech is going through and striking everyone who's posting them, be it a YouTube video or on Twitter or presumably anywhere else. Uh, they're, they're, they're content striking people for posting these images, which is why this didn't go into the rumors section. This is a full-blown news piece because... Uh, this is their console. Uh, so again, I'm not putting the images on the screen or anything. And if you're listening, then uh, this will benefit you as well. It's, it looks like if the Steam Deck and the Switch had a child that then was powered by, uh, the, by, by Android, sorry, and by Android OS. So it's a weird situation. It kind of just looks like an Android tablet put inside of a thing that holds it. It's white. It has very familiar button layout. No uh, mouse track pads that we could see as far as uh, the, the functionality of the Steam Deck. But on these images, the reason I say it's powered by the Android OS, on these images, it looks like it's basically running a modified version that I'm sure Tencent helps Logitech with because that's the other major company that's incorporated into this project is Tencent. And Tencent, for those that don't know, is the same company that owns TikTok, that's right, okay. Um, so weird <laughs> for that reason in and of itself. Uh, but also just, it doesn't look like there's going to be any proprietary gaming. It's all going to be different ways to access different cloud gaming services. And possibly, according to some of the literature, it sounds like they're being very vague, but it sounds like there is the potential that we could also download games from Steam and store them natively onto this uh, onto this platform. So as more comes out about the Logic Tech gaming console, we will be talking about it. But that is what we have for follow-ups. Let's get into regular ass news. Uh, we have no trailers or anything, so jumping right in, we're talking a couple of pieces about Sony. That's right, we're talking the big one, uh, the price hike, we'll, we'll get to that. First off is uh, they are going to be integrating Discord voice chat into the PlayStation 5 uh, dashboard. So it this already exists to a certain degree on the Xbox dashboard, which is very interesting because there are more relationships between Discord and Sony than there are between Discord and Microsoft. So. Uh, yeah, very strange that it took longer to get onto the PlayStation platform than it did on the Xbox platform, but it is happening. Uh, it will take approximately two firmware updates to uh, fully integrate. So the, we, right now, I believe the firmware is firmware 5 something, uh, and it will be fully rolled out when they roll out firmware 7. Uh, so as you don't 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 forget to update your console if you want to get the discord uh integration the other thing like i said we're talking about the playstation price hike we are almost two years into the life cycle of this generation of console and the playstation 5 is not getting cheaper matter of fact it is getting more expensive now uh the official word from sony is that they will not be raising the price officially of the console in the united states very specifically in the united states but almost every other market that they sell the PlayStation 5, the price is going up. Just blanket statement, everyone's paying more, more money for it. Now, that being said, if you were to go and try to find just a base level PlayStation 5, not the software only, but a just a, a hardware ver, uh, uh, playing PlayStation 5, you would not find a basic model. You would only find a bundle. So in theory, the price did also go up in the United States. They're just being a little tricky about it, playing a, uh, a Nintendo, if you will, by bundling in extra software and calling it something other than just a base model. But basically, it's a base model with a game. So yeah, 
interesting. It's they are the only major uh, console manufacturer that is raising prices as it stands right now, though. Nintendo arguably did just also raise their prices by releasing the OLED. Was it worth, I believe it's a $50 price difference from the standard Switch model to the OLED Switch model? Is that OLED screen worth 50 bucks? As a consumer, probably, but as far as raw materials go, probably not. It was probably a five to $10 upgrade. And so they're making a lot more money per console now because they gave us something that we value higher. So, uh, and, and then also probably gonna see a lot of Microsoft bundles happening very soon. Again, as we're coming into the holiday season, just seems likely. So yes, everyone is not technically raising their price, but they are in practice raising the price for their consoles because software doesn't cost that much. And, and these minor hardware adjustments don't cost that much, but they're going to sell them to us at a premium because that's how they make their money back. It is the way of consoles anymore, so it just makes sense. The interesting thing about this is that Sony isn't doing that in other markets. They're just simply raising the price. So very strange marketing decision there, kind of making them look bad. Uh, if anything else comes out of this, we will keep you posted, but let's move right along. All right, our next one has to do with, this is not directly gaming related. This is much more tech related and honestly, creator tech related. AMD has just announced the next uh, GPU chipsets. Uh, the Ryzen 7000 series chips will be launching September 27th. And uh, we just got done talking about how PlayStation, or Sony rather, is raising prices across the board. Well, AMD is almost universally dropping prices, at least by a little bit. Uh, the only exception to that is the baseline model chip is going to be about $100 more than the previous generation when it launched, but it's the only one that's going to be more. The two mid-grade models are going to be approximately the same, if not a little bit cheaper, and then their top end, the 7950X, is going to be $100 cheaper than the previous generation when it launched. And it's going to be, you're not gonna to have to upgrade your chipsets on your motherboard or anything like that. It's all going to use the same saddle so you can just swap out GPU chips. Uh, yeah. Not exactly, but uh, it's basically the same and less power consumption. So it's more efficient, more powerful, just wonderful all around. Assuming they're not lying to us because it is tech and, you know, tech folk are want to uh, make their stuff look as awesome as possible. And that is very potentially not the case. Uh, they're saying AMD is claiming that there is going to be a 29% increase in general performance across the board. Uh, this is more th than just gaming. Like I said, this is very much goes into the creative side of things. So if you're YouTube, uh, if you just are a tech professional of some sort and you need creativity uh, to make your job function, then this is apparently going to be the way to do that because uh, this sounds like right now, this is gonna be the best stuff on the market and it's dropping in price. So that's cool. All right, uh, that is what we have for regular ass news. Let's talk gaming and tech suggestions. Normally we do a game here in the suggestions. This time though, we're doing something a little more techy. And that is some AI art. Night Cafe Studio is the AI art generator platform that I have been using the most. Well, I will be doing a quick and nerdy on the shorts platforms if you are interested uh, to see other options in this arena. But honestly, your best choice right now is Night Cafe Studio. If you don't want to pay and you don't want to wait six months on some waiting list where people could be pushed in front of you in line for reasons you don't understand, uh, yeah, Night Cafe Studio is the best one to do it. It's Fantastic, they just got a stable diffusion algorithm into their arsenal of algorithms. And so, yeah, some really incredible stuff has been going on. Go check out Night Cafe Studio. That's your tech suggestion for this week. Comic books 
in books is the shortest of, I mean, it uh, usually is. It's the way it goes. We have no follow-ups. We have no trailers. We do have an announcement of a new book. Uh, the new book is Harley Quinn, the animated series, dash, the real sidekicks of New Gotham Special. So it's a one-off. Uh, it's going to be sizable, it looks like, but this is interesting. So it's not like the um, Kill Mary F tour book that we got between season two and season three. Uh, it's something else unto itself. This is going to be comic book writers and writers for the animated series and some art that's straight out of the animated series as well uh, that's coming to a book I'm sorry, the Eat, Bang, Kill tour. Uh, the the books here are going to be uh, written by T. Franklin, whose story is Tawny Talks, art by Max Saren, colors by Marissa Luis, uh, then, and then there's Double Dare, written by Franklin, drawn by O'Neill Jones, and colored by Jordi Belair, Identity Crisis, written by Alexis Quasar... Uh, Casarano, sorry, uh, with art by Erica Henderson and Showtime will be written by Connor Chin, drawn by Logan Ferber, Wild Ride written by Jimmy Mosqueda, drawn by PJ Holden with colors from D. Cuniff, Two Jokers written by Jameson Borak, drawn by John Mick Mickle, and colors by Nick Filardi. Tony Esp Esposito will be the letterer for all of these stories in the in this book. So that's going to be the one unifying element. Just uh, the animated series is honestly a whole hell of a lot of fun. So I can't honestly say this book is not going to follow suit. Uh, the, the, I don't generally like the Harley Quinn character for a plethora of reasons we've gone over on the channel before, uh, but I really love the animated series. It's kind of changed the way uh, I appreciate some of these villains, not the least of which being Harley herself, but also... It, it, it just comic books are great to read, and I feel like that's going to be even better than the than the the animated series in and of itself. So yeah, go check it out. Uh, I did not see. Oh, it's on st shelves right now. I apologize. It is on shelves right now, so you can go pick it up right now. All right, uh, that is all we have for regular and everything else. So let's get into comic books and book suggestions. And we're doing another comic book this time, and this is one that recently ended, so you should be able to pick it up in trade form, and that is The Last Ronin. That's right, uh, Eastman and Laird's kind of penultimate piece. Uh, this is very likely the last time they're going to team up, if I remember correctly. I didn't do a whole lot of research into it because it's just a hell of a book. If you don't already know the surprise, I believe it is given to you sometime around issue number three as to who exactly The Last Ronin is. I'm not going to spoil that for you because that is a journey unto itself. Totally worth a read. Totally fantastic. Go find it at your local comic book shop. The Last Ronin suggestion for this week. TV streaming is about 70% follow-ups this week. So uh, strap in and, uh, and honestly, movies is going to be even more. So let's do the damn thing, shall we? Uh, so starting on follow-ups, we have House of Dragon has been renewed for a second season. Surprise, surprise. What with, you know, episode one being the biggest streaming release they've ever seen, this shouldn't be a shock. It is based exclusively on that information in and of itself. So the dip that they had from episode one to episode two did not affect their, uh, their, their decision-making here. And and why would it? It wasn't a major dip. It was a little bit of a dip, but it wasn't significant by any necessarily stretch of the imagination. Um, so there is that. There's, there's, we have reasonably nerdy stuff that we're going to be getting into uh, in a short this week as well. But as it stands right now, that's kind of where we're sitting with that. So next up, we are talking about the Netflix uh, ad supported tier, what uh, many people were hoping was going to be a free option for Netflix, because that would make sense if you're putting commercials in it, that should be paying the bills just fine, not my wallet. But that is not the case. It sounds like they're looking at a price model that is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to nine dollars a month for the ad supported tier for Netflix. Now, that is going to be ads 
uh, approximately four minutes of ads every hour, unless you happen to be watching a Netflix original uh, movie or series, in which case they will not show you commercials as long as you are staying in that series. So if you are just going from episode to episode to episode, you will likely not be seeing any commercials, any ads. Uh, But if you're going from, let's say, you want to watch an episode of Stranger Things, then you go watch an episode of Archive 81, you'll probably see an ad between those two, even though they're both Netflix series, you're changing from one series to the next. So I would imagine the, the vocabulary that they used with this announcement is not is not not confusing. (laughs) Either way, that is where it sits. Uh, When they officially land on a price point, we'll follow up once again. Uh, As we are moving on, we're now talking about one that has me very confused. Uh, Batman, the Caped Crusader, the animated series, Bruce Timm, Matt Reeves, all of these amazing people who have been associated with this project is in fact shopping the project around. It's a Batman animated series that is being shopped to other streamers outside of HBO Max because HBO Max is going through their turmoil. They didn't have the room or the budget or anything to make this happen. So apparently other platformers, other streamers rather, are interested in hosting. How does this work? What are these rights that you can just take a Batman prod property and put it on any other streaming platform? That seems broken. I, th- I feel like this is potentially going to be a play to get HBO Max to see that there is an audience for this cartoon. So they then go, okay, I guess we can do your little Batman show. Uh, I don't I don't see this actually landing on any of the other streamers, though, again, it has been said that uh, that Netflix and Hulu and the like have all been interested, have all voiced interest to the creative team in charge of this series that they would like to host this streaming series. I, I, I don't know. OK, moving on. Next, we're talking about a couple of shows that have wrapped on their principal photography. First up is Echo. This is the next in the Disney uh, Marvel series that are coming to Disney+. Plus. Wrap on principal means that we have a post to finish with, so six, eight months is when we're going to be seeing that. Uh, I am sure the announcement for when it's going to air has been, but I just now thought that I probably should have wrote that down. So my apologies, but they have wrapped on principle. So we're uh, very shortly going to be seeing Echo. Next is Twisted Metal uh, over on Showtime starring Anthony Mackie. They have also wrapped on principal photography for season one. Um, so this one, I don't believe they have released the, uh, the release schedule for it just yet. So when that happens, it should happen soon now that we've finished principal photography. Uh, there is probably going to be a much longer post-production process for this show because I would imagine it's very uh, uh, CG and things heavy. So uh, interested when that gets announced, but it should be soon. Uh, Next is a follow-up on that Dark Matter series. Joel Edgerton, the man who is trying to beat Samuel L. Jackson and Steve Buscemi for most projects in a career. Joel Edgerton has been cast as the lead for the Dark Matter series. Uh, Blake Church's novel being adopted by Apple TV+. (sighs) Breathe. (laughs) That, uh, yeah, cast is growing. We're going to keep tabs moving right along, though. Next is Bad Batch, apparently. And this one probably should have gone in rumors, but I don't know. Just the way in which it leaked was so unique. Uh, Bad Batch Season 2 has been kind of revealed as coming out September 28th. So the end of next month or this month, depending on if you're watching it today or tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, very... The way this happened is somebody got into a, one of those chatbot conversations with Disney Plus help. So they went to the uh, help settings and whatever in their Disney Plus app and got into talking to a chatbot. And they asked the chatbot when the series is going to release. And the chatbot said, oh, it's going to be September 28th of 2022. Can I help you with anything else? <laughs> I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of it. Uh, so 
potentially it's a bug. Potentially it got programmed early. I don't know, but we'll keep tabs some more. Uh, and then speaking of Harley Quinn, like we were in the comic books section, Harley Quinn is now officially coming back for a fourth season as they are almost done with, well, no, we're about halfway done with season three. So uh, I'm digging it. I think season three is a whole lot of fun and I'm excited that season four is happening. So yeah, let's do that, shall we? Uh, that is what we have for follow-ups. Let's get into trailers. We have one new trailer. Yellowstone season five gave us a teaser and... Uh, all will be revealed according to this teaser. Uh, that's a big, that's a big statement to make in this series. Uh, if, if you haven't watched Yellowstone, you've got four seasons of crazy cowboys to catch up on before season five launches. Uh, November 13th is when, uh, we will be getting the first episode of Yellowstone season five. That is what we have for trailers. Let's get into regular us news. Uh, Blockbuster new series on Netflix, which is super ironic because the reason Blockbuster doesn't exist is because Netflix does. So the fact that Netflix is doing a series, a fictional series, uh, based on the final Blockbuster, which I think still exists somewhere in Ohio or something, uh, that's that's pretty ironic. It is going to come out November 3rd. It will be 10 30-minute episodes, so it's going to be a sitcom. Uh, it's starring Randall Park and Melissa Fumero. I don't remember why I know the Melissa Fumero name, but I do know the Melissa Fumero name. I kind of really dig Randall Park. I think he's brilliant, so I, this is going to be interesting. I don't know if I'm going to go so far as to say fun, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, that's what we've got on that one. Let's talk now about another new Netflix series starring Jeff Goldblum called Chaos. Uh, we have a synopsis for this one, and just what I do, what I was able to find out about this show, it's retelling Greek mythology through a modern lens, so super interesting. Interesting. Also sounds like it's going to be a uh, comedy. Um, Goldblum, it has been cast as Zeus. And so the little blurb about the show is as follows. A darkly comedic and contemporary reimagining of Greek mythology exploring themes of gender politics, power, and life in the underworld. Um... So it sounds like, all right, so we're going to, again, we're going to get into this in a, uh, a reasonably nerdy segment in a short on one of the short outlets sometime later this week. But it sounds like the Hollywood machine has started understanding we don't want to be preached at. If you want to include your personal politics, you want to do these certain things, that's okay so long as it is incorporated into a story in an appropriate way and you're not trying to beat us over the head with it. This sounds like it could be walking the line of beating us over the head with it and potentially being just a hilarious reason to watch Jeff Goldblum be awesome. Um... Yeah, I'm going to reserve I'm going to reserve my assumptions until we get a little bit closer to the release of this. But there is a bigger cast here as well. We have Janet McTeer as Hera, Cliff Curtis as Poseidon, David Thewlis as Hades, Killian Scott as Orpheus, Debbie Mazur as Medusa, Daniel Lawrence Taylor will be Theseus, uh, Missy Butler, Leela Farzad, Naban Rizwan, Re Reiki. I'm I am not saying these names right, and I am apologizing for it. Uh, Reiki Ayola, Aurora Perino, and Stanley Townsend uh, with a special cameo from Billy Piper, who is big for a number of reasons, not the least of which uh, Penny Dreadful and Doctor Who. So yeah, sounds like a pretty big and ensemble-ish cast that <laughs> At the center of it is Jeff Goldblum, who is in and of himself the reason to watch this. So that sounds pretty awesome. That is what we have for regular ass news. Let's get into 
TV streaming suggestions. Our suggestion for this is, like I have said a number of times throughout this episode, Harley Quinn season three is happening right now. You should be watching it. That is the suggestion for TV streaming because it's it's scratching the itch that the Venture Brothers left. Uh, I mean, you can go back and watch Venture Brothers. That is also on HBO Max. It did not get cut, um, but if you have watched Venture Brothers a uh, half a dozen to a dozen times, like myself, then you can probably recite those episodes by heart. This is new stuff that is in a similar vein that can actually use some of the superheroes that they were parodying in the Venture Brothers. It's a little bit of a different kind of scratch, but it's still the same itch. Does that make sense? Yeah, so much fun. Go check out Harley Quinn. That's your suggestion. And movie section is probably 80% follow-ups. So bear with me, guys. <laughs> Let's do this. All uh, right, starting with The Crow, we now have Danny Houston has been cast in this movie. Uh, the director, Rupert Sanders, has also said very recently that they are deep into pre-production. Uh, I did not write down the rest of the cast. I apologize, but there is a bit of a cast attached to this already. So that's pretty epic. Let's move on. Fantastic Four, Matt Shackman has been signed to direct. We talked about this previously as a rumor, so this is confirmation. Shackman will be coming on. Shackman, who was previously set to uh, do Star Trek IV, has left the Star Trek IV project and is now officially doing Fantastic Four. That's kind of big. That's, that's kind of really big. And uh, yeah, there, there's a lot more to it than that. We'll follow up later as things break. Uh, let's get into our next piece is Pinocchio. We have a release date for Netflix. December 9th is when it will be released on streaming. This is going to get a theatrical release as well. That date has not been made public just yet, though hopefully it has happened soon because I feel like this is going to be a fun one to see in the biggest, on the biggest screen possible. So yeah, uh, Pinocchio, December 9th. Next, we're talking about Red Sonia. Uh, we have been keeping tabs on this. It's been slow going, but we now have a new lead for the movie, Matilda Lutz. Principal photography has begun in Bulgaria. So they are actively making content for this movie. Uh, they are set to head over to Greece soon on that uh production as well. Uh, next, we're talking again about Star Trek 4. Star Trek 4 is back on track after the, you know, all of the issues they've had, not the least of which losing Shackman. Uh, they have Josh Friedman and Cameron Squires writing the script. They have yet to replace Shackman, but that this is at least some forward momentum. It is going to happen. We are going to get a fourth Star Trek movie in the Kelvin timeline. Then we're talking about the Monsters. Monsters, we now have a release date for their Netflix movie. Uh, the release date is September 27th, so about a month before I would imagine where Zombie wanted to release it, Halloween. Uh, but uh, yeah, this makes a little bit of sense. I'm still very apprehensive about this movie, so we're moving on. Our last piece of follow-up news has to do with Ryan Johnson's Star Wars trilogy. According to Johnson and Kathy, Kathleen Kennedy, this is still a thing that they are actively in discussions with. It seems, according to Johnson, that they are now mostly trying to work out when scheduling could make sense for them to begin production on the first of said trilogy. Uh, I really like Ryan Johnson. I think he is a good movie maker. However, I don't really like the Last Jedi, so we are at an impasse. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know what to think about this. I don't know where I stand. I know the Star Wars community is not super kind to Johnson, and I understand why. But I've seen his other outings, and they're good. So hopefully he can fix that. I don't know. Uh, that's what we have, though. Let's move into trailers, and we have some great trailers. First and foremost, we have Weird, the Al Yankovic story. 
trailer starring Daniel Radcliffe. Oh my God, I love this. This looks like, like they're billing it like it's a serious biopic. And like, it looks like that's how Radcliffe is going to be playing it. He's going to be the straight man in this world of abs abs absurdity. And I think that is so incredibly awesome. You should definitely go watch the trailer for this. Uh, next, we're talking about Terrifier 2. Uh, we have a couple of horror movie trailers in this movie's uh, movie trailer section. Uh, Terrifier 2 falls into the same pitfalls of every other lower budget uh, trailer we've seen and that it kind of gives us a little too much of the movie and we see a little bit too much of the kills. Less so for this than the other one we're going to talk about here in a minute, but uh, yeah, I, if you liked the first one, I'm sure this is going to be a step up on quality because there's a little bit more of a budget because they've proved they could do the thing now, but also more of the same. So if you liked that first one, I, judging by this trailer, you're going to like the second one. Uh, next is Hellraiser. Oh, this is not the one... This is the other, this isn't the one I was talking about. Hellraiser, the new movie, October 7th is gonna be the release date. It's going to Hulu. Um, this is just a teaser. This is really like 12 seconds of mm, kind of sort of teasing the new female pinhead and or gender fluid pinhead. I think she's trans, I don't remember. I apologize if I've offended, whatever. Um, yeah, so. I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of this. And so far it looks like the imagery, the little bit that we've got is on track. So we'll see how that goes as we get a proper uh, trailer when we get closer to that August or October rather 7th release date. Uh, and then the one that I was talking about was Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. We finally have a trailer for this, what is sure to be an atrocious horror movie that is just going to be entirely too much fun to watch. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, there's still no proper release date yet for the movie, but this trailer definitely gives away too much. There is way, it's like the Halloween Ends trailer. Like I saw every kill in this trailer that, uh, so why, I don't know. It's that I, that's trailer making more than movie making that, that needs a, a, an adjustment there. But yeah, that's what we've got. Uh, our suggestion, we're going to start, <clears throat> since this is getting into September, we're going to do the entire month of September and the entire month of October. All of our movie suggestions are going to be horror movie suggestions, even though I wanted to suggest UHF, Weird Al's actual movie that he made. Uh, we're going with the theme here. So the theme is horror. Uh, the first movie suggestion for horror is Event Horizon. This movie was probably the scariest thing of my childhood. I remember being so frightened by this movie. Even though it takes place on a spaceship, I still had nightmares. And continue to love this movie, much like you should as well through into the future. Go watch Event Horizon if you really want to get some creepy, creepy sci-fi vibes. That is your suggestion. Which then brings us to the rumor mill. All right, so we have a confirmation. Uh, actually, a refutation, not a confirmation. We are refuting a rumor because it has been shot down. It Again, the genesis of this rumor and the refutation all have existed in the span of the week since the last episode we've done. So we can't talk about the rumor because it's been shut down. Uh, but there was a rumor, a nasty rumor at that, that Amazon was going to be purchasing EA, as in EA Sports. It's in the game. Those guys. Uh, no, Amazon has come out and said, we are not actually going to be doing this. This is not a thing. Uh, stop telling us about it. We're done hearing it. So yeah, not happening. Moving on. We have a new source for a rumor we've been talking about uh, actively, actually, and that is the uh, Superman rumor, being that Henry Cavill will be returning to the role for a future undetermined number of movies. Uh, we have a new pretty solid, actually, couple of sources here, and they're all saying the same thing we've been talking about. It seems like, with the change in management over at Warner Brothers and Discovery, it seems like we will be seeing Henry Cavill in at least one more Superman movie. 
I think this is pretty, because we are hearing it from so many places at this point, and because we know that The Rock is friends with Cavill, and they have the same management, and so he's really been pushing for this to happen, he seems to have a pretty good in with the new management at Discovery Warner, so yeah, it's this, uh, we're 70%, and that's, I think, kind of conservative. I think the likelihood is actually higher, but conservatively, we're putting this 70% likely that we will be seeing Cavill in the suit and tights again. Uh, next, kind of along those same lines, we have a rumor about the Justice League. Actually, this one comes from a number of leakers as well. All of them saying that with Dan Lin in the big executive Kevin Feige-like position with DC... Dan Lin is wants to make a new Justice League movie, and not just a new Justice League movie, but a new Justice League using the cast from the Snyderverse. So we'll be seeing Gal Gadot, Jason Momoa, Ben Affleck, so on and so forth, uh, all return for a new Justice League movie, and maybe even Ezra Miller. That, yeah, a very interesting situation there. Uh, we do have a number of places saying this. We don't, though, yet know that Dan Lin is the guy. Very likely he's the guy, but it's not 100%. Nobody's signed on dotted line. So there's evidence to say that it could not be just as much as it could be. So 50% likely we're going to split that difference. Uh, Fantastic Four, we have actually two rumors. There's more than two, but two that had the most legs as far as rumors go. We have Evan Peters is very potentially going to be returning in this movie movie as a quote-unquote different character. Who that different character will be, we don't know, uh, but it, that is the rumor, is that Evan Peters is going to be coming back in the Fantastic Four movie. I think, the based on the, the reputation of the leaker here uh, associated with this, uh, I think there's about a 60% chance that this is going to be a thing. Um, I think that's a little generous. I think there's still enough evidence on the other side to make you much more trepidatious about believing this. But, again, reputations being a thing, we're going to say about 60% likely we will be seeing Evan Peters as his actual character. I think that's probably the more appropriate way of saying it. Not different, but actual character in the MCU uh, in the Fantastic Four movie. Our other Fantastic Four rumor that we are talking about, again, there were a number of casting rumors associated with this. The only one I felt like had any legs at all was uh, Regé Jean Page and uh, Seth Rogen both being cast as Mr. Fantastic and The Thing, respectively. Um, there was a, a laundry list of actresses who might be playing Mrs. Fantastic or The Invisible Woman or Sue Storm, whatever name you want to give her. And then there was one about a kid that th the source wasn't the greatest uh, of, for who's going to be playing The Human Torch. Again, laundry list of, of actresses means that this is just somebody's wish list. And then I want to get a couple of confirmations from other leakers, other insiders and such before we talk about The Human Torch. So the one that had the most legs, again, Regé Jean Page and Seth Rogen as Mr. Fantastic and The Thing. I'm going to split the difference on this one. Um, 50%, there, there is, there's a lot up in the air. There's a lot of variables here that really, some of them need to settle before we can say which direction they might be going with any of this. Seth Rogen doesn't seem as likely as, as, as Jean Page. Uh, Regé Jean, or however I'm supposed to say, however he prefers uh, his name to be pronounced, I do apologize. Uh, but yeah, as it stands right now, again, not enough on either side to say one way or the next. So 50%. Uh, next, we're talking about Chris Evans. There are two rumors around Chris Evans as well in the MCU. So uh, Chris Evans' MCU return will be one more movie potentially Secret Wars, though the rumor does not say for sure it's going to be Secret Wars. It just says that he's going to be coming back for one more movie. Uh, I think that... I think that the associated rumor here that we're going to get into in a moment is the thing that's kind of bolstering this rumor. So I'm giving this one 60% and I'll tell you why as we're discussing the next one. So the next rumor is that Chris Evans and Kevin Feige have kind of come together as a means to, as the outlet that I got this rumor from put it, quote unquote, ruin Captain America. Um, the... 
the way the actual leaker put it is that Feige and Evans want to distance Captain America from his nationalist roots, which to people who believe as Chris Evans and Kevin Feige is a good thing because the globalism is the way of the world. No, but we're not going to get into a political discussion. However, uh, that is that that is definitely the way, especially Chris Evans is that's the mindset that he finds himself in. I don't know about enough about Kevin Feige's personal politics to say for certain, though what with some of the announcements that they've made uh, in the recent past about, you know, the, the femini feminizing the, the Marvel Universe and certain decisions that Feige has made for the reasons he's told us, sounds like that is also the way the political mindset that Kevin Feige finds himself in. So when we hear a rumor that says they're going to distance Captain America from being an American nationalist, which, you know, 20 years ago was a good thing, um, then, yeah, I would tend to believe that. However, this is a rumor based on a rumor, technically. So while it does bolster the rumor we were just talking about, it also relies on the rumor we were just talking about. So we can't go over 50% no matter how much I want to believe it. So 50% is the uh, where we are going with this. Uh, our next rumor is She-Hulk. We have a, it's, it's a significant one, kind of, in that the rumor says, that She-Hulk is going to be the vehicle through which we get introduced Deadpool into the MCU. Now, there is only one source saying that this is going to be a thing, so that generally isn't enough to go on, but we do know that She-Hulk is not doing so well. <laughs> uh, when you try to make a show that panders to people who don't watch the type of programming you put out, but are very vocal about social political decisions which you make in said programming you're not going to get a big audience it's just not going to happen so that isn't exactly all of the downfall of she-hulk i think there are a number of other things i think tatiana maslani is doing okay as the titular character i think that there's there's just a the, the plethora of other issues that are going on behind the scenes that are just kind of neutering this show. It could be something great and they, they, they have to do these certain things that don't make sense because social politics and blah, 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 blah. So as a way to redeem it and, and because it is a natural vehicle through which we can just introduce random characters because She-Hulk is an attorney so she can represent them in legal issues, right? So at the end of this series, there the rumor says we're going to be seeing a cameo. It's not going to be like he's going to be the central focus of an episode or something like that. It says it's going to be almost a post-credit stinger worth of cameo. So the likelihood they bring in Deadpool to boost the numbers is pretty good and the likelihood that they are want to do something like that also tends one lends one to believe that that is a direction they would go so all of that being said back to the original issue with the source we're going to say 55 percent likelihood that this is a thing it's just a little bit more likely than less likely so yeah that's where we're sitting with that and we have a lot more to talk about, nerds. It's just in older videos. You're gonna have to go check those out. Uh, click or tap the boxes that are about to show to the left of my, or side of my face. Either way, appreciate your face, nerds. Thank you so much. Right of my face, I think, is where it shows up on the video. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. If you're following behind your ner nerd news, you can t click or tap, again, one of those boxes that should be showing up right about now. Don't forget to subscribe, do all the things. We appreciate your faces. We'll see you in the next one. Before we go, though, always, Always remember that if it's generally nerdy, it's probably here.